All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Have you ever been frustrated by the fact that New England IPA hops that are always popular are always out of stock or super expensive? Well, watch on as I show you how to brew a New England IPA that should be just as good as any of those, except using some lesser known and cheaper hops. All right, so hey, if it's your first time here, first of all, welcome to the channel. Thanks for checking it out. What we do primarily here is grain to glass videos. What that means is taking a beer all the way from its recipe stage, through the brew, through the fermentation, and into the final tasting all in a single video. So you get to see everything in a single video instead of searching around on my channel for other little pieces of the brewing process for the same beer. If you like that kind of thing, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button too while you're down there, and uh, you'll see a new graded glass video from me probably as frequently as I can brew, so about every two to three weeks. Okay, so the impetus for this beer really came around because uh, somebody I know in person uh, kind of requested that I brew this beer, so I obliged. I haven't had a New England IPA in a while, and it makes a solid winter IPA, to be honest. Um, but that person and myself both have a common love of mountaineering, mountain climbing, uh, hiking, trail running, stuff like that. And so I figured it would be kind of cool to try and theme this beer around mountains. Um, and using the hops to kind of make that happen. And so I did some exploring and uh, I found a list of hops that should work pretty nicely in a New England IPA that are also mountain themed. So those are obviously the good old standby of Cascade. Uh, also, I came across Denali, which should be a pretty solid tropical fruit bomb, and, and also Summit. So each of those hops has uh, something they can contribute to make this New England IPA pretty tasty. They also have the benefit of not being necessarily expensive, or always sold out. All right, so if this is your first time brewing a New England IPA, um, it is an awesome beer to make, and it can be a lot of fun. It can be very rewarding, but is a difficult beer to make. But if you don't have equipment that either allows you to A, close transfer into a CO2 purged keg, or B, bottle from a closed fermenter, and then also purge the headspace from those bottles with CO2, then you might be in for a very difficult time brewing. Uh, because these beers are exceptionally susceptible to oxidation and it's a pitfall that we've all fallen into. The first New England IPA that most of us have brewed has probably uh, turned gray and had no hop flavor after about two weeks. It is an unfortunate thing, but with a little bit of careful precision, you will be able to uh, work your way around it. I have brewed a New England IPA on this channel three times before. The first time was kind of a failure. The second and third times were much, much better. But I'm going to like the video that uh, I recommend you watch first before you brew this New England IPA because I'm going to go over some tips and stuff in that video uh, that will make you more successful if you try to brew the style. So that's going to be up here in the corner. New England IPA is an awesome style and it is a very different type of beer than its West Coast cousin. Uh, New England IPAs first and foremost are hazy um, instead of clear like the West Coast IPAs. The second characteristic that makes it different is that it is not decidedly bitter, rather it is juicy and flavorful without being aggressively bitter because it capitalizes on late boil and post boil hop additions where you get that kind of character, as well as a large dry hop. These beers are going to be fuller bodied than their West Coast cousins. Uh, they're not going to finish dry, they're going to finish full. The water profile is also going to bias the flavor towards a fuller feeling, maltier finish, as opposed to a drier feeling, hot forward finish that you would get out of a West Coast IPA. And the whole point of that is to cut down on that bitterness. Also, another thing that is pretty much characteristic of hazy IPAs is a biotransformation. What that means is basically uh, there's certain yeast strains that you use that are capable of biotransforming dry hop additions. And what that means is you do an early dry hop about two or three days into fermentation, and you still have Krausen building up on top of the surface of the wort. And what happens is that yeast chemically interacts with the hop oils and creates these wonderfully aromatic compounds that also get manifested as extra juicy flavors. Um, and it's a thing that really only happens with hazy IPAs, so it's pretty unique, but it's pretty interesting. Just keep in mind, not all yeast strains are capable of doing this. All in all, it's a challenging but rewarding style of beer to brew, and there's absolutely no reason not to try it, even if you don't feel like you're fully equipped for it, and even if you don't have the capacity to close transfer. It is not a completely detrimental thing, it will just cost you a couple weeks of shelf life. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the recipe. So uh, the base malt for this recipe is going to be split between Pilsner and Turo because I kind of want a little bit of a, a play between those two base malt flavors in this beer. So I'm going to do six pounds of Pilsner and five pounds of Turo. And I'm going to follow that up with a whole bunch of protein producing malts. So that'll be two pounds of flaked oats, two pounds of flaked wheat, and two pounds of white wheat. And that white wheat is going to have this nice 
rounding effect and smoothing effect on the actual mouthfeel of the beer. Uh, something that I think was missing from the last time I brewed a New England IPA where I didn't use the white wheat. The hops are going to be split into two editions for this beer. Nothing is going in for the boil. We're going to do a straight 60 minute boil just because. Um, you could probably go shorter if you wanted to. Um, but we're going to do a whirlpool or a hop stand at 175 degrees Fahrenheit with three ounces each of Cascade and Denali. And then uh, three days into fermentation, I'm going to go ahead and dry hop with two ounces of Summit and one ounce of Denali. So Summit is not going into the Whirlpool specifically because it seems to have a pretty pungent oniony garlicky character to it that seems to be reported by a lot of people. However, if it goes in the dry hop, it seems that oniony garlicky flavor goes away and instead you get a very powerful uh, tangerine and orange explosion uh, from the dry hop. So we'll see how that goes. For yeast, we're gonna go with the standard uh, New England IPA yeast, which is Y Yeast 1318 London Ale 3. I've used uh, Imperial's A38 Juice, which I believe is actually it might be the same strain, uh, as well as Voss Quike, which was a fantastic yeast to use for this beer. Um, and I think I've also used Giga Yeast Vermont IPA, which was okay. If I was going for the Conan strain, I would go for Imperial Barbarian Yeast. That's going to be the Conan strain. So uh, I would use that if you're trying to uh, replicate Hetty Topper or any of the beers from The Alchemist that started this whole New England IPA thing. Uh, for water, this is going to be important. This profile is kind of geared towards a maltier, fuller finishing beer um, because we have a higher amount of chloride versus sulfate uh, distribution within the mash. And uh, that is going to give us a little bit more of a multi finish. But you could also go for a balanced profile if you wanted to with relatively equal amounts of those two ions. But I just I would discourage you from going for a high sulfate to chloride ratio because that's gonna create a bitter beer, uh, which is not exactly what we wanna go for in this style. So we're starting with eight gallons of distilled water and I will be adding two grams of gypsum, one gram of Epsom and 10 grams of calcium chloride to it. And that's gonna get me a profile of 105 parts per million of calcium, three parts per million of magnesium, zero parts per million of sodium, 49 parts per million of sulfate, 159 parts per million of chloride and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. Um, and I think that should land us in a pretty solid mash pH range as well. And also because this water profile is distilled water, you should be able to copy it for yourself and use it in any of your hazy IPA recipes. And last but certainly not least, we're gonna go ahead and mash this at about 154 degrees Fahrenheit for 90 minutes. That's gonna be a higher temperature to mash at so that we get a, uh, a little bit more residual sweetness. My last couple New England IPAs have finished kind of dry at about 10.10 10 to 10.12, kind of dry for the style. I'd prefer something more about 10.15 to 10.18. So we're going to try and achieve that by a higher mash rest. All right, so now we'll go ahead and mash in. Once my strike water reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with a grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps that were in the mash. Next, I started recirculating and let the mash sit for 90 minutes at 154 degrees to ensure a complete conversion. 10 minutes in, I recorded a mash pH of 5.3 and added 3 grams of ascorbic acid, also known as vitamin C, which is a strong antioxidant which helps to drastically extend the shelf life of New England IPAs. Once 90 minutes had elapsed, I set the temperature on the controller to 168 degrees for the mash out. This denatures all enzymes in the mash and helps the wort drain through the grain bed a bit easier. After reaching the mash out temperature, I let it stay there for about 15 minutes and then I pulled the grain basket out and let it sit for another 15 minutes draining. However, as soon as I did that, I made sure to fire up the controller to 100% power in order to kind of get a jump start on the boil. I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading and recorded a pleasant measurement of 17 bricks or 1068, which was exactly the beersmith estimation after setting my efficiency to 65%. Once I reached the boil, I did exactly nothing, letting the wort boil down for about 50 minutes. At that point, I started recirculating boiling wort through my chiller to sanitize it. This is the easiest way to ensure sanitation of your chilling equipment. After 10 more minutes had elapsed, I ended the boil, and I let the wort chill to about 175 degrees Fahrenheit, where I set my controller to maintain that temperature. Uh, at this point, I added the Whirlpool charge of 3 ounces each of Cascade and Denali. In an attempt to maximize hop utilization for this step, I used the grain basket as a giant hop spider, which sort of worked. 
I took a sample and recorded an original gravity of 17.5 bricks, which is about 1070, uh, obviously much lower than planned, most likely due to the extra cold weather. After the 20 minute whirlpool was completed, I took the entire setup inside where I could hook my chiller up to the sink and begin chilling. Once the wort reached the groundwater temperature of 65 degrees, I transferred to the fermenter, splashing to aerate, and pitched my yeast. Alright, so the brew day overall went pretty well. Uh, it was pretty cold as you can see, so I didn't quite get the efficiency that I wanted to, and my OG was a bit lower than I had expected, but uh, what can you do? I'm not too upset about it though because it's pretty much ballpark right where I wanted it. Alright, so for fermentation of this one, uh, ideally you're going to want to try and keep it somewhat colder. Because it's an English yeast, they typically like to ferment somewhere around 60 to 65 uh, instead of your typical 65 to 68 or even higher for American ale yeasts. Um, and so I would recommend sticking in that, that colder temperature range uh, just at least for the first week because that is going to keep your uh, fusel alcohols under control. So if you end up fermenting this one a little too hot, you could be running the risk of introducing some hot alcohol flavors into your beer which can obviously ruin the beer. So just try to be careful with that. So two or three days into fermentation, we're going to go ahead and do our biotransformation dry hop. Uh, so that is going to be the two ounces of Summit and one ounce of Denali. And the way that I like to do this, because I have a Firmzilla, um, I have this little collection jar that's underneath of it, and you pressurize that to um, a higher pressure than the rest of the fermenter is in. So in this case, it would be no pressure for the main compartment, and I did about 15 PSI on the small compartment at the bottom. You put your dry hops in there on brew day, purge that container with CO2, and then whenever it comes time to actually dry hop, all you have to do is open that little butterfly valve, and the hops get sucked into the beer, um, and it's uh, it works like a charm in most cases. If you don't have the capacity to do that, though, don't fear, because during the biotransformation period, you're actually dry hopping when fermentation activity is at its highest, so you have CO2 pushing oxygen out of the fermentation vessel. And effectively, that means you can just take the top off and throw your dry hops in if you want to. Um, so it is actually pretty harmless time to dry hop. Now, that being said, a lot of New England IPA recipes will suggest adding a second round of dry hopping after fermentation is complete. And that is so that you can add even more aroma into the beer. I've done that before, but it's a bit more complicated because that is a period of time in which your beer is indeed vulnerable to oxidation. So that is when you're really going to want to have some sort of oxygen-free dry hopping uh, method. I suggest usually having um, like a small hot bag and some magnets to secure it above the wort so that when it's time to dry hop you just pull your magnet off and the whole thing drops into the wort. Um, that's usually a pretty good method that I've used plenty of times before and it also works on bucket fermenters. And of course you could run the risk and just toss them in real quickly and shut the lid right away. But if you have the capacity to purge your headspace with CO2 before and after you dry hop, it should actually minimize oxidation even if you have to open the fermenter. I am not actually going to be doing a post-fermentation dry hop because I personally don't like the flavors associated with a ton of dry hops. I get a pretty nasty hop burn sensation when I use over four or five ounces of hops in the dry hop and that is basically to me a very off-putting thing uh, and that tastes like a very tannic harsh flavor at the back of your throat when you're drinking the beer. Thankfully it goes away over time um, but it's still not a pleasant thing and I want to be able to drink this as fresh as possible. So we're going to elect not to do that. And what I'm going to do is elect to preserve all of the aroma for my first dry hopping edition by just simply pressurizing the fermenter, the Firmzilla, to about 10 PSI for the remainder of the fermentation. And what that's going to do, hopefully, in theory, is lock all of the uh, volatile hop aromas in the actual fermentation vessel. And then that way you don't end up losing them through off-gassing uh, CO2. And that, hopefully, should supplement the need for a second dry hopping addition and therefore cut down on hop burn at the end of the process. And that, of course, is all experimental. You don't actually have to ferment this beer under pressure, um, but it's an interesting kind of idea. So we'll just see how it goes. Uh, in a nutshell, though, you're going to ferment this beer if you're using 1318 or another English strain um, at about 60 to 65 degrees for a total of probably about two weeks. Um, but two or three days in, if you're following my recipe, you'll biotransformation dry hop. And then if you want to, you can add another dry hop after fermentation is done for some extra aroma. Um, so it is all up to you. The world is your oyster. Final gravity for the New England IPA is here and it's about 10, 16 now after about 10 days. All right, so here we are about 13 days from actually pitching the yeast. 
Uh, the fermentation on this one went very fast, actually. It was a very good, clean fermentation. Everything went well according to the uh, temperature steps that I set up and the fermentation schedule. Nothing went wrong. Um, I ended up dry hopping in about day three and then I extended the fermentation for about five days after that. I don't really like to let my beer sit on the dry hops for more than five days because then you start to risk developing some like grassy off flavors and also some other undesirable off flavors. So generally you want to rack your beer off your dry hops into a secondary fermentation or into a keg at that point and that's what I did. I did a closed transfer to a pre-sanitized purged with CO2 keg and I let it condition in that keg for another day at room temperature. Then I took that keg and I put it into my keezer so I cold crashed it basically and let it sit in the keezer and condition for about four days while it slowly carbonated. So as a result, we ended up with a primary fermentation time of about nine days and then about four days of conditioning time. I pulled a final gravity sample and I degassed it in order to make sure that it was accurate. That's what you saw earlier before this clip. And now it is uh, day 13, basically, and we are ready to taste this thing. New England IPAs are generally awesome when they're fresh and they're generally at their best uh, when they are fresh. So we're gonna go ahead and waste no time on this and jump right into the actual review on it. I can tell you very confidently that these hops uh, that are not super mainstream actually work out really well in this New England IPA. And as to specifically what kinds of flavors and aromas and other characteristics we get out of them, well, let's jump into the pour and find out. All right, so I ended up calling this beer Climb to Glory. I'm sure that's gonna make a couple 10th Mountain guys pretty happy. Uh, comes in at 7.2% ABV and 24 IBUs. All right, so for appearance of the beer, it's a nice pale gold, obviously quite hazy, uh, to the point of being opaque, although I don't think it's as milky um, or as thick of a haze as some of my previous uh, New England IPAs have been. The head on it is nice, creamy, robust, and long-lasting, uh, pure, stark white head uh, with good structure. I will say I don't think it's as pale as some of my other New England IPAs have been, and uh, this is one of the first ones that I've used two row uh, as a portion of the base malt in, and so that definitely paid off in the flavor department, but I think it also added a slightly darker hue to the beer than some of my previous uh, New England IPAs that used only Pilsner malt and wheat malt and flaked grains um, ended up. So next up we're gonna go in for aroma. And I can tell you it is most certainly quite strong. Uh, however, I'm not 100% sure if that is due to the fact that I did a, you know, a good solid dry hop with a high alpha hop, or if I actually got anything out of pressurizing after my dry hop and locking all the aromas in there. I don't know if that made a tangible difference because this doesn't really seem to stick out too much from the other high aroma New England IPAs that I've brewed. All the other ones that I've made have had super fantastic, very strong aromas, and I didn't pressurize at the end of this. So I don't know if that really made a tangible difference. What I can tell you though is that the aroma is absolutely full of apricot and like a, a grapefruit kind of thing, as well as a slight amount of dankness. Um, and there's a little bit of like a tangerine, I think, as well. You also get a decent whiff of malt out of this, uh, which is something that kind of struck me by surprise. Uh, and there's a little bit of uh, kind of like a wheatiness that comes through. All right, so next up we'll talk about the mouthfeel. Ooh. So first of all, this is definitely one of the first times that I've actually nailed the final gravity on a New England IPA and gotten it up high enough in the proper range uh, where there is enough residual sweetness to really make the mouthfeel a bit fuller body. Some of my previous New England IPAs have felt quite full bodied, um, but over time that kind of dropped off. And what happened was while the beer was still juicy and flavorful and you know didn't have that aggressive bitterness, the lack of overall finishing sweetness kind of played into convincing you that it was more of a bitter IPA. Uh, it is, that is kind of a very roundabout explanation of what I think happened, but the point I'm getting at is the higher finishing gravity in this guy and the bit of residual sweetness in the end of it makes it a actually very balanced beer and ends up kind of snipping the uh, potential bitterness of the hops just a little bit. And it actually works out really well. The overall feeling of the mouthfeel is not too heavy. It's not heavy full. It's, it's like a medium kind of full, closer to like a wheat beer. Um, and speaking of that, actually, you also get a lot of the smooth, soft, pillowy, creamy mouthfeel from an amount of flaked grains as well as uh, the wheat malt that I used. Very happy with the mouthfeel. It's definitely getting to that point now where my New England IPAs feel the way they should. On top of that, 
It's actually 7.2% ABV, uh, but does not feel like it, not at all. <laughs> and telling you this now, having actually sampled a beer prior to the tasting video, so I made sure that I actually knew what I was talking about, um, I'm already feeling that first beer. It's definitely a kicker, and it definitely doesn't drink like you think a 7.2% beer would. It doesn't um, have any sort of excess carbonation levels, so there's no stinging of the tongue. There is no additional carbonation bite. There's no additional added acidity there, uh, so it, that's a good thing to see. All right, so now let's go in for the flavor. First of all, I think that this is probably the most balanced New England IPA I have ever made. Um, so I really surprised myself there. What I really like about this is that it has this wonderful balance that's being struck between uh, all of the juicy compounds and, and flavors that you get from an early dry hop and from the Whirlpool, and also the malt complexity. This has a lot more to offer on the malt side than uh, my previous New England IPAs have. It's got more of a white bread and kind of like a crispy crackery um, character to it that blend together very well. And that is the whole reason why I decided that I wanted to mix Pilsner in two row. Um, because the white bread is more from the two row and the Pilsner is giving you kind of that crackery flavor. Um, and the two play very well together and make the, uh, the finish of the beer actually taste good. Add on top of that the element you get from the wheat and the fruit grains, which is more of like just a, a richness and, and kind of velvety uh, character. And it really ends up being a very, very interesting malt profile for an IPA. And I haven't even started talking about the hops yet. But let's of course go into the hops because that is kind of the main attraction of the beer. So for the flavor, uh, first of all, there is no bitterness. Um, it's just not really there. Yes, you will get a little bit of bitterness from a Whirlpool edition, but it's not even close to what you would get out of a uh, bittering edition for the same amount of IBUs. So that being said, I have no real bitterness to this, but you get a solid amount of hop flavor and hop character. The first thing I'm getting out of this is just a solid pineapple. Um, and that is really boosted by the like finishing sweetness of the beer, uh, the residual sweetness uh, that makes it kind of seem more pineapple-like. I think if that sweetness wasn't there, it would turn into more of a grapefruit, um, almost getting like a pithy stone fruit kind of thing going on too. Now, the other interesting thing that's coming out of this, which I believe would be attributed to the Denali, is lemon. Um, there is a like lemon zest character that's coming through and it's, it's kind of got a little bit of a zing to it, a little bit of spice to it, I guess you would say in some cases, um, but it works really, really well. Obviously, Cascade doesn't have a super high contribution to the flavor here, but what it does come through as is more of that kind of grapefruity, melony character, um, and it also boosts that tropical stone fruit kind of, uh, kind of flavor in there as well. Cascade, I think, would go unrecognized in this beer if I didn't mention it. Um, but it does absolutely contribute. And then of course the Summit. Uh, the Summit I used purely on the dry hop. I think the Summit contributed a decent amount to the flavor here in probably kind of the spice and the lemony department. Summit is definitely known for being a little bit better of an aroma hop than in a flavor hop um, for reasons I discussed earlier in this video. But uh, that tangerine character I was getting out of the aroma I think is mostly due to Summit. And I think in some degree, the tangerine is also in the flavor as well. But you know, if you've had one New England IPA, you can pick out tangerine, melon, grapefruit, all those flavors in pretty much all of them. So uh, it is a little bit, it's a little bit difficult here for me to really pinpoint which hop is doing what thing um, in this beer. Because when you add them all in late boil, they tend to throw a lot more of those fruity and you know, tropical type flavors. I am very happy to report though that there is no oniony, garlicky character or even like a bell peppery character in this um, that I was a little bit concerned about getting even with the Biotransformation Dry Hop. Um, in fact, speaking of bell pepper, I would equate the Denali to being similar to Equinaut or Equinox. Just not having that actual bell pepper flavor. Um, I made a beer with Equinot before, uh, trying to highlight its characteristics, and it was really bell peppery to me, and I didn't like that, but it had a lot of other pleasant characters. Um, and I think the Denali is actually very similar to that, just, I, like I said, missing that, that unpleasant bell pepper character, and I would definitely use this again in a heartbeat in a New England IPA, or any other IPA, to be honest. Denali has a lot of heritage with Nugget, um, in fact, it's dubbed Nuggetzilla in some places, um, and I can see why. 
it's a fantastic hop to use for most purposes, I would say. It is kind of the highlight of this particular brew, and it's a solid hop. Um, yeah, I just don't see it used that frequently, um, and not sure why. It's fantastic. I'll definitely be using it again. As usual, I'm going to go ahead and talk about what I could improve on this beer. Um, it is a little bit difficult for me to really pick out specific things in this one because it's good. It's really good. <laughs> Um, I don't want to be too freaking arrogant about it though. Arrogance aside though, I don't think it necessarily stacks up to some of the stronger, more juicy offerings of New England IPAs. Um, it's not at the top of the list of, you know, the world's most hot forward New England IPA, but it's definitely not at the bottom. It's not like a New England pale ale by any means. Um, I think if you were looking for a juicier and more intense New England IPA, um, I would substitute CTZ in for Cascade. CTZ is Columbus Tomahawk Zeus. Um, again, it's, it's a cheap hop, widely available, not typically thought of as a New England IPA hop, um, but has a lot of those nice kind of pineapple-y dank characteristics that can add some sort of, you know, pungency to your, to your beer. Use it in Whirlpool or Dry Hop or both, it's great in either case. Uh, so that would probably be my suggestion if you want to stick to three hops or, you know, just throw in a fourth hop and, and just add some extra complexity in there. Um, for some reason, everyone likes to have three hops in their New England IPAs, and I'm not sure why, but I've also followed that rule without really thinking about it, but nothing wrong with four. Overall, I am extremely happy with this beer. Um, while it may not be the most hop forward New England IPA that I've made, like I said, again, it's definitely not in pale ale territory, um, but it also ends up being the most balanced and drinkable New England IPA that I've ever made. Um, out of all the recipes that I've put together, this one is probably the most pleasant to drink. Uh, and that is, that makes me very happy. So hey, if you like this video and you learned something, please hit that like button. It's more than just a gimmick, it does actually matter. And please hit the subscribe button while you're down there. Uh, I will typically kick out a new grade to glass video every two to three weeks, which is just about as frequently as I can brew. But if you want more frequent content updates, I have an Instagram, which is at the apartment brewer. That's updated more frequently, obviously, than YouTube. And also up here in the corner, I have a Patreon, where if you want to check out some additional video content, that is your place to go. Um, also, in the description box, you'll find a complete recipe for this beer, and that is tuned for the claw hammer system, but if you have a robo brew or a grain father or some similar all-in-one five-gallon system, you'll probably have a similar result. Uh, just maybe you might need to tweak that a little bit, but that recipe is there in full for your usage. Also, in the description box, there is a list of all of the equipment that I use for home brewing in addition to the claw hammer supply system and links where you can buy all of that. And if you're interested in the claw hammer system, there's a specific link for that one as well. And clicking on any of these links and actually purchasing the product is a great way of helping out this channel monetarily as well. And I do really appreciate it. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.